Good afternoon and welcome to the third virtual retro seminar. My name is Alan Morrison. I'm Professor of Law and Finance at the Side Business School at the University of Oxford. I'm joined on your screen by two other people. Pete Del Mota is the Intesa San Paolo Research Fellow at the Oxford University Centre for Corporate Reputation and she co-convenes this seminar series with me. And Steen Valentin is Pro Associate Professor at Copenhagen Business School. He's an expert on corporate social responsibility, sustainable development, the politics, ideology and governance of responsibility on the circular economy and critically for today's talk on industrial symbiosis and trust-based leadership. I'm going to turn the floor over to Steen in a moment, but first, as we have a number of new seminar attendees today, I'll just make a few brief remarks about the seminar series. Retro, or Reputation, Ethics, Trust and Relationships at Oxford, is a seminar series that is very generously sponsored by the University of Oxford's Centre for Corporate Reputation. The seminar series is concerned with the ethical and normative content of trust and reputation in organisational life. Before the coronavirus pandemic, Retro was an Oxford-based series, but moving online has at least allowed us to include in the conversation quite a lot of people from around the world whom we otherwise wouldn't be lucky enough to meet. So today I'm very happy to be able to welcome people from the United Kingdom, from all over Europe, from India, from the United States, from Africa, from China, and from, se um, from several um, countries I haven't mentioned. A number of people have helped Rita and myself make these seminars happen. We're grateful to Rupert Younger, who's director of the Center for Corporate Reputation, and to Marie Watson, Chris Page, and Mark Hugh Morgan, who've helped us, to clear, helped us to clear a number of unexpected hurdles. I'm personally very grateful to Rita for the exceptionally hard work she devotes to these seminars. Today's seminar addresses questions that are at the heart of the work we perform at the Centre for Corporate Reputation. Steen's going to discuss industrial symbiosis, and in particular, he'll be studying the way that industrial symbiosis occurs. It appears to be more successful when it's self-directed and organic than when it's planned, but organic symbiosis doesn't just spring up in arm's length markets, it requires trust. And Steen's going to provide us with a fascinating new theorization of that trust, this works clearly profoundly important as we address increasingly complex and important environmental problems, and Steen's talk's gonna give us plenty of food for thought. Steen will speak for about 30 minutes, during which time he'll respond only to clarification questions. And after that, we have some time for Q&A. Please enter questions and comments for Steen into the Q&A box, and either Rita or I will relay them to Steen. You can find the Q&A button either at the bottom or at the top of your screen, depending on the device that you're using. We're going to finish the seminar promptly at five o'clock this afternoon. So, Steen, thank you, and over to you. Thank you very much, Alan. I'll just get my slides up and running. There we are. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present and discuss my work. As mentioned, my name is Steen Valentin. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Management, Society and Communication at the Copenhagen Business School. I'm also the academic co-director of our CBS Sustainability Centre. I will get right into the swing of things as I don't have that much time for the presentations, 30 minutes. Uh, I will be basing my presents presentation on a paper that I've submitted for this year's EGOS conference. It is a work in progress, so please feel free to challenge and come with all kinds of questions to anything you see or hear within the next 30 minutes or so. As reflected in the title and, and also in Alan's very clear introduction, I will be focusing on relations between self-organization, planning and trust in the making of, if you will, industrial symbiosis and certainly at the end of my presentation I will focus in particular on the need for more if you will rigorous theorization um, uh, more rigorous understanding of, of, of the functionings of trust and in industrial symbiosis it's, 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 it's indicative it's symptomatic of research in this field that is we often point to trust as being very important but more elaborate theorizing is, is often lacking um, as a starting point, I mean, I, I, I will not deny that in, in, uh, in my life and in the work that I do, I'm in many ways formed by, if you will, the Danish experience. I'm sitting here in Copenhagen right now and that talking about the Danish experience in regard to sustainable development, uh, circular economy and industrial symbiosis, uh, um, that will be my starting point. So let's have a kind of a broad take. What about the Danish case? How is this, How is it interesting? 
Well, uh, one of the reasons why is that supposedly Denmark is uh, nothing less than number one among all countries in the world when it comes to delivering on sustainable development goals. That seems uh, pretty amazing and perhaps also somewhat perplexing or surprising considering our level of consumption in Denmark and certainly also a very intense agriculture and animal production. Um, uh, certainly when we talk about environment, this placement can seem somewhat uh, misleading, but it's kind of a typical part of the way that the Danish experience is being framed as, you know, top of the line, world class and so on and so forth. And I should say, Obviously, we do have a very ambitious climate policy in Denmark now, climate law, the commitments that other countries have made, perhaps more, a little more loosely, has, has been made into law in Denmark. The uh, going rates, the um, climate law of, as of December 2019 uh, is aiming to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 70% in 2030 and to achieve climate neutrality in 2050. And very much aligned with the Danish tradition of cross-sector dialogue and collaboration and trust, government has set up 13 climate partnerships to, to help with this uh, extremely difficult process where we, we know that there are so many things we don't know in terms of technological know-how and, and should solutions and so on and so forth. Why do I mention this? I mentioned this as already indicated because uh, certainly parts of the literature on in industrial symbiosis seems to contradict this, uh, you might say, this picture. The, the Danish model and the Danish developments here are very much indicative of the fact that we live in a time where there seems to be, at least in some quarters, almost like unprecedented belief in planned sustainable development. The head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has even talked about um, the green transition being Europe's man on the moon moment. We are entering a phase where governments is supposed to have a lot of say in, in how to do this and set ambitious goals and so on and so forth. However, industrial symbiosis, the way that we have talked about it, has often can be considered, as, as Ellen also mentioned, kind of a more of a self-organizing thing happening from the ground up, more bottom up. And, and the literature is strongly reflecting this and, and essentially posing the question, to what extent can planned sustainable development be effective? Part of the reason why the, the, the discourse has been twisted in, in this way can be found in the, the, uh, the, the, the case, uh, the, the, the template, the benchmark at the very heart, at the very center of the whole uh, literature and, and, and discussion of this industrial symbiosis. And that case is the, the Kallenborg case. This is a picture of the greater Kallenborg area. As you can see, it looks nice and green um, and rural, and it certainly is both these things. It is certainly also much more in Kallenborg. You find the largest industrial park in Denmark. It is also the largest biotech production site in Scandinavia. And supposedly, the total economic activity in this area amounts to something like 15% of Danish GDP. Its industrial claim to fame, certainly in this area, is the uh, Kellenborg symbiosis, symbiosis, which is laid out like this. Maybe you get a sense it's actually not a very big thing and it doesn't involve a lot of actors. Perhaps that is part of its, its success that is sort of a miniature lab uh, compared to many, you might say, industrial parks or efforts at making eco-industrial parks happening in like certainly China and South Korea. This is actually almost like a miniature, you might say, uh, uh, certainly. It is the number one symbiosis of its kind in the world, the first one that was discovered. It is ubiquitous, you might say. It's the benchmark uh, and uh, exemplar that has been used endlessly in, 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 in literature, uh, as a, again, as a benchmark for, for the development of eco-industrial parks uh, and, and similar initiatives in other countries. It has also, also served to, as an inspiration for, for government programs supporting industrial symbiosis. In the UK, for instance, where the first one in the NISP was set up, I think in 2005 or six, and in, for instance, China and, and South Korea. For those of you who are not extremely painfully familiar with, with what industrial, industrial symbiosis is, and the point is a lot of people who are also interested in, in sustainability more broadly, perhaps have not really gotten around to understanding what is taking place in this particular realm. Certainly, I didn't know much about the symbiosis, say five or six, seven years ago, and this has to do with a kind of silo mentality in, 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 in research that I will get back to later. But the most recent, you might say, graphic depiction of what this iconic example is all about is, you can see it here, even with moving, uh, you might say, uh, streams uh, of, and ex exchanges here. Industrial symbiosis is the very, you might say, um, um, essence of companies coming to, industrial companies coming to together, collaborating to make 
waste into value to make waste streams into resource streams, whether we're talking about energy, water, or material. We're talking about physical exchanges here. Uh, as you can see here in the, the heading, uh, I've called it a complex adaptive system of bilateral contracts. And that is just meant to indicate that, uh, going back to the whole issue of planning, that this uh, was and is, again, an industry initiative and each and every one of those uh, streams that you see here and each exchange here is a product of a bilateral contract entered into by two companies or organizations in, in, in this uh, network, this partnership. It's not something, even if there is a board, it's not something that is decided in, in some centralized location. You have different actors here. Most of them private, some of them, again, local government. Importantly, for instance, we have Bastel, uh, more or less in the middle, the power plant that has recently uh, made the transition from, from coal to, to burning of wood chips. It has been a recurrent critique of many industrial symbiosis around the world that at the heart they had fossil fuel providing energy. That has also been the case in Kellogg until very, very recently. This transition only happened within the last year or so. You have the local utilities, uh, there's a lot of water involved in this. You have renowned Danish industrial companies, Novo Nordisk uh, Markets, one of the market leaders in, in insulin. Uh, worldwide, Nova, Nova Symes, uh, again, a market leader in enzymes. You have it, you know, the former stat oil and oil refinery and so on and so forth. Again, this is uh, uh, the, the iconic symbiosis. There's a lot of awareness uh, among the different companies as this is a di very dynamic thing. Each time they make a graphic depiction like this, it's kind of almost like obsolete the day after because Again, resource streams and exchanges, the pattern is changing uh, all the time. But there's a Keen awareness, this is again, it's not just a technical endeavor, it's very much a social one, it's the people that make things happen. And, and of course, we use technology and so on and so forth. Corporate collaboration, values of trust are very, very important in this. Importantly, again, this is not a new thing, as already alluded to by Alan. Um, um, there's been a lot of self-organization here, and I will get back to exactly when and, 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 and how uh, the Kellogg uh, uh, symbiosis was discovered or uncovered. Uh, like I said, it's not a, a new thing. It had its humble beginnings. Actually, back in the 60s, they have decided on the year 1972 as the official launch year. Uh, but so, so it's been with us for, for quite a while. It's not big, as you've seen. This is not a case of, you know, uh, an impressive scaling up sustainability. It is quite small. It has remained small. It's not extremely uh, a very fancy thing. It's getting a lot of credit internationally. But if you go there, it's not very fancy. It's sort of a humble place in Denmark. And uh, we, what we find here is production people and engineers, not people who uh, talk fancy about strategy and so on and so forth. So it's very much part of what we call production Denmark. What has happened over the last five to 10 years is sort of a rejuvenation of it, a part of it from it being there and being mentioned in not countless, bit, but in a lot of research articles. Uh, the different parties, industrial parties with uh, Novo Nordisk uh, at the helm has kind of rejuvenated the, the, uh, the industrial symbiosis so as to make you might say more out of it because with the climate crisis and the kind of urgency around that it's becoming even clearer that this kind of model seems to be what the world cries out for and needs more of so they have kind of amped up the storytelling the branding and, and again trust has played an absolutely crucial part in that and and the storytelling part these two formulations from their 30th anniversary publication are just two examples of how they now describe their, their own accomplishments here. Certainly also, I mean, the Kellenborg symbiosis, for better or worse, has also provided the template for how industrial symbiosis as such has been defined in academia. And Marianne Chertoff has been one of the dominating forces. I'm sure she has visited the Kellenborg uh, symbiosis countless times. Her definition is widely used. The notion of in traditionally separate industries, that's in itself very challenging. And an important point about the, the Kellenborg symbiosis is that there are no companies uh, part of this, uh, as part of this network that are in direct competition with each other, that can certainly be an impediment to the kind of trust and the kind of reciprocity you can put into this. Traditionally, several industries engaging in some collective approach uh, to also to gain competitive advantages, not only environmental advantages, it involves in physical exchanges, Again, very much about collaboration as has this element of geographic proximity to it uh, that where we often related to industrial parks and, and so on and so forth. So certainly Kellenborg has been, again, it's a small thing and not fancy. I had a couple of American uh, MBA students I, I took there who basically said, this is so underwhelming, this is so small and the people at Kellenborg 
do recognize that kind of feedback from, from visitors. But again, perhaps part of its charm is exactly that you, you can gain a, an overview. It's not like some of the pro, pro, uh, prestige projects in China that are uh, yeah, almost the size of, of small cities uh, in, in themselves. Again, the way that, again, <laughs> The Kalimborg thing came into being is, is interesting also because it goes back to, you might say, the very beginning of the modern uh, debate about sustainable development. Uh, as most of you will know, we had the Brundtland report in 1987, our coming future. Uh, and then uh, kind of ushering the modern era of sustainable development, uh, also as promoted by, by, by UN in, in various uh, initiatives and, 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 and so on and so forth. Two years after, and this is kind of the standard story of how you might say the whole discipline of industrial ecology came into being, two people, uh, high ranking people from the research department at General Motors of, of all things, produced a, a paper in, I think it was Scientific American, suggesting a new model of an industrial ecosystem that was able to do exactly what they were doing in, in Kellenborg. However, these two Americans did not know that there was such a thing in the world already when they, when they wrote it. They kind of provided an academic idea. This is what needs to be done. And then the very same year, also suggesting the kind of humble mentality in Kellenborg, the great discovery took place. Uh, and it, it was actually related to the fact that a couple of, um, a group of high school students uh, came to Kellenborg and, and found that something with the pipes uh, that are laced out open in the area, that something special was going on and then they made a small model of it. And then the, 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 the people there understood that something special was taking place and the, 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 new, the news spread, if you will. So it was only something like 17 years after the thing was of, uh, officially launched, it came into being, that it was actually discovered or uncovered. And from there on, of course, it has taken on different significance and meaning. Before the discovery, nobody talked about it in environmental sustainability terms or in responsibility terms. Uh, in, in, in academic literature, there's been a lot of focus on these people are just doing their job and trying to, to, to optimize their business. I will get, get back to that. These are constitutive elements, uh, moments in, in, you might say, the, 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 the emergence of industrial ecology as a discipline that can be found among other disciplines that sustain uh, the, the, the whole field of circular economy. And I, I guess I've taken uh, these disciplines from a paper by Cohen and they strongly focus on the elements of disciplines of circular economy that relate to industry and technical engineering and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, industrial ecology has established itself uh, as, 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 as a strong, uh, uh, you might say, uh, 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 discipline within that field. It's often been criticized for being perhaps providing ideal solutions and not being probably rooted in, in practice and so on and so forth. We can perhaps get back to that discussion. But within industrial ecology, we talk about industrial symbiosis solutions and we talk about the creation of eco-industrial parks, more or less interchangeably vis-a-vis uh, -vis the notion of geographic proximity. I think these two terms are almost interchangeable. Again, in terms of providing ideals versus practices, I saw a paper where a researcher said in France, there's no such thing as eco-industrial parks. And another researcher pointed out there is no such thing as an eco-industrial park that actually delivers on, you might say, the goals of, 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 uh, of creating a truly circular economy. But again, there are ideals that are trying to push developments in that direction. Then about the social that I used in the heading. What is the problem with existing research? Well, I'm not really criticizing existing research as such. It's, it's been doing a good job and there is kind of an extensive, I think very nuanced literature on uh, 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 industrial symbiosis compared to many uh, parts of the CSR debate, for instance. However, there has certainly been a tendency, again, for, for, for some kind of silo building that, you know, papers about this are published in journals like Journal of Cleaner Production or Journal of Industrial Ecology and has a strong kind of engineering uh, dimension to it, whereas mainstream journals in, for instance, the organizational field that I know very well uh, journals like organization, op studies, even general business ethics hardly has anything on this. And the, the problem you might say with the fact that the, the, the mainstream research on, on industrial symbiosis has not connected with other, those other disciplines is simply also perhaps something to do with that, that there's something missing in terms of making their technical, uh, you might say, models connect with the real world of practice and, and, and deeper, keener understanding of the social and relational uh, determinants and, and, and causes of success and failure on this. 
I was a very, very small, small part in a failed research application at one, on one point where some of our British colleagues did a review of the circular economy literature and came up with the heading, the missing social they talked about saying, in all the literature they reviewed, more than a thousand papers, only in 14% of, of, of these papers was any mention of the social or the organizational even made, any mention, was any mention made, which we kind of indicate an overemphasis on the technical. And that provides us with some answers, but certainly not all answers in terms of uh, defining what is success and failure in this field. Uh, and that means I tap into with this paper and with a lot of the critical stuff that I do, um, try to go up against the stream saying that there's certainly as Andrew Hoffman has said in a paper on very critical paper on the climate science ideological wars you say that there is, there is this tendency for for the sustainability literature more generally to be dominated by the physical sciences and define the problem and by economics and defining the solutions and I would certainly give you examples of that in regard to industrial symbiosis we need to kind of move beyond that while also recognizing and acknowledging the important contributions that have been made under those conditions um, but I should also emphasize that I'm not being a complete original here, uh, I'm uh, proposing a completely uh, novel, uh, you might say, contribution. People like the, the late Edward Cohen Rosenthal and, and others have uh, very strongly emphasized how we need to look at industrial ecology uh, as, a, as, as he put it, a fundamentally social and organizational construct. And there are a number of papers also, uh, older ones by, by Danish researchers that strongly emphasize uh, social, property, social properties and embeddedness, if you will, um, the broader societal embeddedness of, of, symbi uh, of industrial symbiosis. So there's certainly a lot there to draw on, but again, when it comes to trust, for instance, it's, it tends to get a little thing. In terms of then an advantage point for, for, for theorizing this, or problematizing theorization in this field, uh, a very obvious question can be posed, and it was posed actually more than 10 years ago by, again, Marianne Chertov, who asked, if industrial symbiosis is so advantageous, why are we not seeing a lot more of it? And I would uh, argue that it's certainly uh, still relevant to ask that question. And the answer, again, has a lot to do with this interplay between self-organization and planning, and it kind of goes back to the Kellen Bock case. Uh, you might even speak here of the Kellen Bock paradox. I mean, how can you make a benchmark out of something that is unique? How can you generalize, you might say, the experiences of something organizing itself and uh, building from, from the ground up. Uh, that is certainly something that uh, has been a continued conundrum here and it has been pointed out in a number of research contributions by Chertoff and others. Uh, and as has been pointed out, a planned Kellenborg has yet to develop in spite of its, in, in, sense, again, in, in the sense that Kellenborg is not very big or necessarily a very fancy experience if you go there, uh, but a planned version that, that can again perform some of the same stuff that, that Kellenborg has, has simply not emerged. And a lot of people will say that's because, you know, you cannot just plan this. Social environmental planning will not necessarily get us there. And of course, that has a lot to do with a more general problem regarding knowledge transfers and, and stuff like that, and how you cannot just make that, that happen, uh, so to speak. Chatov has also uh, provided a, an interesting analysis uh, where she's been talking about looking at developments in this field in terms of different phases. And she talked about sprouting in a paper with Ehrenfeld, sprouting, uncovering, and embeddedness and institutionalization. Again, this is very much based on the Kellenborg experience. The idea is that in the sprouting phase, things were just happening of their own volition. Uh, then the uncovering took place. And after that, we've seen a lot of you know explicit institutional work, embeddedness, storytelling, branding, and so on and so forth uh, taking place. Arguably, you might say, are they three phases, or is it more like you know uncovering being an event, defining you know, uh, kind of a before and an after? That is certainly something worth discussing. But importantly, I mean, the kind of argument that that was made here uh, uh, was that uh, again talking about the, the the humility, you might say, of 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 of, of parts of Danish industry. The idea was that before the uncovering. Uh, the symbiosis was something very implicit. Uh, as, as a former site manager in, in the 40th anniversary publication suggest, it evolved quietly and anonymously. It wasn't noticed by anyone, he suggests. Uh, and it was just about optimizing the, the processes. There was no special environmental awareness or anything like that. It was just, you know, uh, smart business people, engineers doing their job, uh, basically, and, and, and trying to optimize. And this has then been translated into, you, you might say, a theory suggesting that actually understanding this in purely economic terms, uh, 
as a market model is, is actually smarter than overemphasis uh, on economic uh, uh, social responsibility or sustainable development and all that kind of uh, uh, hoopla. It was basically you know just people doing their jobs. And the argument by Shatov and Erdfeld is then also that the more robust uh, systems, and that's what this experience shows, again, more closely follow this model of spontaneous order or serendipitous development, uh, complex additive systems, rather than any notion of central conscious planned development. And again, part of that uh, conclusion is based on the fact that uh, actually we others have not been able to reproduce the Kalmbok experience. Again, there's some theoretical uh, front lines involved in this. Uh, I've tried to illustrate this. What we have then is in the sparring phase, it has very much been explained in terms of kind of a confirmation of, 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 of market logic, saying this is a realm of economic self-organization. We can use standard market models to explain why this works. And actually other models seem to, to, to miss the point. It's purely and simple, you know, something that can be explained most effectively by modern economic theory, neoclassical economic theory. Whereas you might say, in the embeddedness and institutionalization, the reason why I put and trust in, in brackets and question mark is it's not quite clear to what extent they also allow for trust to be part of this because trust is basically not a part of the neoclassical model, model of competition. It's somewhat irrelevant in regard to that. And then you have the realm of social and economic planning and trust and, uh, and, and you might say the manufacture of trust facilitation, you might all the different roles that can be played by different actors. And that comes out as being, you might say, somewhat inferior to the more superior model of self-organization or spontaneous order. Pekin and Howard Greenwell have suggested that we, in, in regard to the former, we can, uh, we can talk about serendipitous development uh, where, as opposed to goal-directed development. And these have to, in some literature, kind of been juxtaposed. Uh, I would argue that perhaps uh, this is kind of a redundant way of, of looking at it. These days, maybe we need to go beyond that. Because to accept this model of a before and after, uh, in these times where there's such an urgent awareness of environmental issues, is like hoping against hope, perhaps, that we can find another Kalenburg that has just, has just developed by itself. Maybe this kind of crude before and after needs to be replaced by something else, a more keen awareness that of the here and now and the fact that we need to look at different models and different ways of working with, with uh, you might say, industrial symbiosis. We need to consider them on, on the same sort of depth. And I'm, I'm not the only one that have come up, come with that, come to that conclusion. Uh, for instance, Pekin and Hal Green will talk about facilitation as some kind of middle point between serendipity and, and, and goal-directed development. And actually, Boone et al, and this is a paper by all the big stars in this field from 2016, has also suggested something along those lines. And instead of this kind of, again, crude before and after, idealizing a before where things were just happening and again, could perhaps be explained well by economic models, we need to realize that a lot of different things are happening now, that self-organization is certainly part of this facilitation by third party public actors, vis-a-vis -vis the symbiosis center and other actors, and, and also government plans considering again government mandated programs in, in UK, China, South Korea, a lot of countries actually. We need to take account of all this rather than just looking at this before and after. So in that paper from 2016 they're suggesting different pathways in order to kind of cover all the different ways in which we can we can uh, promote and further developments in this field. And it's the same kind of road uh, that I'm going down uh, with, with my effort. Let me just check how we're doing for time here. Uh, doing reasonably well. I should be finished in about five minutes. Um, how to then theorize trust in this? As I mentioned, and this goes for a lot of different areas, I'm also doing work on trust-based leadership in the public sector. And there again, a lot of people talk about trust as being important, but they're not really integrating it into their theoretical models. And a recent paper by one of some of our colleagues from Aalborg University in Denmark has suggested that actually the state of the art literature in, in, in this field lacks a framework and a research agenda. That's kind of a very conventional ways for academics to make their uh, work seem relevant, but there's something to it that there's certainly a lack of a more rigorous backbone. Uh, that is in, it, is, it, is, it, it is in its infancy, as they suggest. They then proceed to focus on how individual firms can develop trust, uh, very much kind of a meso level perspective. We want to do something else, going back to also trying to cover all the different, you might say, mechanisms that make or break developments in this field. We want to theorize trust as part of the social constitution of industrial symbiosis as more at more of a macro level, if you will. And we take two different cues. 
the notion of trust as an organizing principle that again cannot be seen in isolation but needs to be considered alongside market and hierarchy uh, you might say price and authority uh, mechanisms uh, we can then see trust as a very distinct mechanism that kind of orient enable or constrain economic behavior uh, that uh, works through the structuring and mobilization of interaction patterns and exchanges as put by Mark Everly Peronenser here in 2003. And, and more importantly, perhaps we, we also built on the work of Paul Adler, uh, who's famous for his work on social capital, but also for his work on trust. He talks about market hierarchy and community as ideal typical forms of organization, modern capitalism again works through price authority and, and trust as coordinating mechanisms and we very much then want to then focus on understanding better how trust works as a coordinating mechanism alongside the other two uh, and we're not just interested in, in providing some kind of idealized view saying that trust is good and control is not so good uh, it's more like what is what is the what are the functions how can we analytically better understand this i don't have a lot of time to explain this but what we try to do what i try to do is then built uh, and adapt the typology provided by Adler in his paper of 2001, uh, where he kind of distinguishes uh, between, again, hierarchy and market, high and low determinants, uh, uh, and, 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 and adds, uh, you might say, trust as, this, as the third variable, talking about high and low trust uh, uh, modes, uh, forms of, of trust. And very briefly, uh, to get to, to the point where we are, there's uh, some open ends here, definitely, but uh, like I said, it's a work in progress and you're welcome to ask questions. The idea of applying, uh, you might say, Atlas model to, to this field is to say that, again, we need to understand developments in this field, different pathways, the different modes of organization, as uh, you might say, an interaction of a market hierarchy and, and, uh, and, and trust here. We have cut out, you might say, the lower quadrant saying if there is no, you might say, uh, hierarchical support of, of, of uh, in, uh, industrial symbiosis and no market support is really a no-go. So we don't need to consider that quadrant. But on the combination of high market and, and low hierarchy, we then have what we would call uh, informal symbiosis, which is very much akin to the situation we have. I've described, described already where you know things are happening uh, with a kind of very low in a uh, level of you might say government in, in involvement. Importantly, however, instead of reducing that into a matter of you know this being about you know just economic contracts, spot contracts uh, on the market, we get a different vocabulary talking about relational contracting. It allows us perhaps to to tap into and challenge these conventional notions that uh, in this sphere, in this kind of sphere, we can just rely on economic theory. Maybe there's something to the concept of relational contracting that is useful and re actually relational contracting as a concept where the notion is that contracts also be built on and sometimes uh, so to some extent rely on trust. Relational contracting has been has not been mentioned in, 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 in this field at all. So perhaps that is a way to kind of build a more nuanced understanding of how trust actually makes a difference even in under the conditions of more informal organization here. Um, then there is um, the, the what we have called formal symbiosis which uh, again in, in indicates both uh, corporate involvement, high market uh, concern, a high, high market determinant, determinant and high uh, authority but still with a focus on you might say uh, uh, in particular uh, market actors and here we can tap into the experience that there are different ways for companies arguably to to, to, to take part in, in, in modern explicit you might say government uh, supported symbiosis both those who do it very proactively and have you might say drunk the kool-aid and, and see a, a big thing in this and others that might be laying low and, and basically uh, engaged in a much more low trust kind of way they are part of it but they don't necessarily commit very highly to, to the very notion and concept and, and, and um, project uh, of, of, of symbiosis. And then finally, and I should probably add that you might say Atlas model was thought of as you might say very much located within the tradition of market hierarchy and network going back to Coase and Williamson and transaction cost economics. It was all about capturing different forms of corporate agency, you might say, uh, uh, sorry. Um, 
what we do here is to say that this model can also encompass other types of agency. And when we move down to what we call embedding, which suggests it's an ongoing effort, it's not something that's accomplished, we can talk about enabling bureaucracy, very much associating it again with the facilitating function, saying that, again, rather than you might say under coercive bureaucracy, talking about rules and mandating certain, uh, you might say, patterns of, of action or behaviors, enabling facilitating function can play a huge role and again in facilitating relations and setting up these things uh, it's a way of kind of synthesizing these different insights and then how facilitation can work and coercive bureaucracy then becomes a matter of saying what happens if we, we, we start experimenting with trying you know to replace you might say social trust promoted through enabling bureaucracy with, you might say, systems, trust, or, or basically uh, rules and laws. To what extent can you further the development of, of industrial symbiosis through, if you will, more coercive forms of authority and so on and so forth. The idea here is, is again, going back to the different um, pathways here is that using this model, uh, and like I said, I'm aware there's a lot of openings, is a way to then try to ex make explicit the different functionings of trust, the, the high trust forms over the vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the low trust forms, and to capture, a, again, how trust functions within, uh, among the different uh, a part, parties to this, different actors with their particular forms of agency. So this is how far I, we, we, we've gotten with this. And uh, like I said, I, I hope this uh, inspires some, uh, some questions and uh, thoughts, uh, whatever. Uh, this is the final slide for me. So uh, let's take it from there. Thank you. Christine, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. This is fascinating and gives us so much to think about. Um, I, before we go into more detailed questions. I'd like to just start by zooming out a little bit. Um, and I was wondering, could, could this, this analysis uh, teach us lessons for other areas where market and hierarchy and their associated coordination mechanisms are coming short and where society would benefit from concerted organizational actions such as um, human rights issues and supply chains, for instance? I definitely think so. I mean, one of the problems would some say uh, are for instance the way that the uh, sustainable development goals are being approached is that there seems to be a, an outspoken willingness to kind of go straight strictly very directly to kind of a weak version of sustainability and talk about it in terms of business case and you know you just have to redefine your corporate strategy the business case still applies and so on and so forth and certainly focusing on on trust as a value and as a coordinating, enabling, co coordinating mechanism is one way to kind of challenge this, you might say also, the, 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 tend, the tendency to reduce this to, to kind of either, you might say, the market uh, or, or government. And, 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 and see, is there some, some ways in which, again, the, the, the community argument can play a role to, to can mediate limitations of, of, of both. So I haven't thought this through, but there's certainly a lot of stuff in the way that this is, has been talked about and the belief and disbelief in plant development that, that, that has a broader relevance here. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question here, Steen, from Bruce Guy here, who um, is asking how one could understand your um, typology of trust, your, 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 your framework for understanding trust, in terms of um, cultural background and cultural backdrop. So presumably um, the cultural surroundings, both organizationally and within a society, affect the extent to which trust can be formed and extent, affect the extent to which things like hierarchy might grind it out. Has this sort of thing been analyzed in studies of, um, of, of, uh, of, of industrial symbiosis or is it, is it outside of the, the field at the moment? It, I guess the short answer, and maybe I'm, I'm not doing quite justice to some of the very smart people in this area, but I guess, again, the answer is yes and no, because um, many years ago, I mean, it has been acknowledged that actually, when you look closer at what's, what's happening here, the regulatory context and, again, social norms, norms of trust, uh, norms of contributing to the local community has played a considerable role in, in actually um, as, 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 as co-determining, you might say, causes of action of these companies. You cannot 
ultimately reduce it to kind of optimization in terms of, you know, how can we do this with this or that process? It has been acknowledged, but again, perhaps there's a need for a more, more rigorous theorization. And I like to think that the framework of, of Adler, at least as I'm trying to adapt it, and I'm aware that there are certainly some things about this that is not quite transparent at this point, that it is open to, you might say, taking into account those cultural differences. Because one of the points, one of the reasons why, for instance, you might say the, the, the Kellenborg model has not traveled better than it has, a lot of people would say, is exactly because of the Danish model, the high uh, trust model, that can be taken for granted uh, here and, and not, uh, you might, in, in many other places, not <laughs> actually, uh, we have also ex had experiences from other parts in Denmark, closer to Copenhagen, where it didn't work. So there's a huge cultural component. And again, as part of the research agenda that I'm talking about, I mean, if you just reduce this to, again, natural science and engineering, you tend to completely bypass the cultural, uh, you might say, the dimension of the equation here. And we need to take that into account, also in terms of understanding, again, not only success, but also, Failure. So we have a question here that I think um, is, is, is related to what you've just been talking about. Um, Subhadra is asking about uh, the influence of nationalistic tendencies in um, the, the potential that there is for this type of industrial symbiosis to arise cross-border. So um, the question is, can, can trust play a big role between countries cross borders to enable industrial symbiosis? Well, I mean, industrial symbiosis, again, vis-a-vis -vis the notion of geographical proximity has very much been related to local, you know, areas rather than perhaps being something that is very cross border. But I think the question as such is extremely relevant. And it actually reminds me of, I mean, uh, responses to Atlas paper back in uh, 2001. The paper has been cited, uh, I think, thousands of times. But if you read the commentaries that several was printed, one of the arguments that Atlas makes, and he's now, you know, kind of a, he was always kind of a post-Marxist, now he's a democratic socialist uh, guy. I mean, he wrote this book recently, The 99% Economy. He's, he's very ideological, extremely bright. I like him a lot. But basically, they were saying, they were talking about the myth of the ideology of trust. And there's a certain concern here. I mean, if we in, in Little Denmark can take trust somehow for granted as part of our social fabric and tapestry, how does trust travel? We're living in a world, and a lot of people will say that, I mean, for instance, got to work relationships, gig economy, and what, whatever it is, does trust play a loom large and larger? That was the argument actually made by by, by, by Adler in his paper in 2001, trust plays a larger, larger role in the knowledge economy and in, in modern capitalism. Is it true? I mean, uh, we are not so sure about this. We, we, there's a lot of things happening with the polarization in the world that seems to point in other directions. And unfortunately, I don't have, have the answer to that. It's just a matter of saying, we need to be careful. We need to be nuanced. Uh, we, we need to not idealize uh, or idolize trust. Uh, we need to, be very smart and be culturally attuned to what the circumstances are. Uh, I think that's what I want to say about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, a related question um, tries to link what you're saying about trust in social contexts and particularly with organizational, cross-organizational contexts with um, ethical stories about trust. So um, Lawrence Cranders um, sent us a question saying, well, People think about trust in two ways. It has an ethical component that ought to be able to trust you. Um, and it, has, it also operates as an organizing principle. When I can trust you, we can do things we otherwise couldn't do. And he's trying to get at the way that those two ways of thinking about trust um, connect. And maybe he says one way to do this is to say, well, the ethical claim um, is part of the ethical structure of persons in relationships to each other. So. <laughs> Does that suggest a route into thinking about how these symbiotic relationships work? Are they um, ethical at a deeper level than simply the fact that they're using the, using the ecological infrastructure more efficiently? It's a little hard for me to hear you now, Alan, but I think I got the, the most of it. Um, um, I can say from my own preferences, and like I said, I've been working with the notion of trust in regard to leadership, in particular in the public sector, and I've tried to approach it in, in sort of a, 
pragmatic sort of way uh, saying, I mean, there's a very, very strong ethical component in this, but I'm very much, I mean, indebted to sociological trust uh, theory uh, that do not see trust as you might say, um, that different takes, ethical takes. Uh, Lustrup, the, the, the Danish philosopher, has one of the famous uh, takes on, you might say, ethical views of trust as some kind of unconditional value, so to speak. The sociological view of trust, and here I'm, uh, among others, uh, among others, very indebted to the uh, German sociologist and system theorist Nicholas Luhmann, is it's very much about again understanding trust as conditional and relational and and always at stake and being built up and broken down and so on, so to speak. So in a sense, we are we are we are recognizing the value of the ethical component, but approaching it fundamentally as kind of a, a sociological phenomenon that can be, uh, if you will, approached in a in a more pragmatic sort of way, so that you. Are not also, you might say, just accused of providing, a, you might say, some some kind of ethical discourse, but are also able to to argue that actually this makes pragmatic good business sense. This is actually a smarter way to to engage, uh, without again resorting just you know, to the kind of argument you find in the kind of airport literature on trust, which strongly talks about smart trust and you know fast trust, enabling the wheels to turn very very fast. I think that's a that's that's in between there. Um, um, so so. Um, but again, in terms of the ethical component, I think there is something there. But for instance, in the Kellenborg area, they have been, not been very aware of it. But uh, they, they, they've, they've, they've kept their eyes, perhaps some of these people, too much on the prize and haven't seen the bigger picture. But there are some strong values that are very much ingrained in Danish society uh, that ha you can say has been a part of, 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 of framing their ways to go about this. I don't know if there's a clear answer at all, but if we, it's my it's it. Lita. Yes, we have a question here from Nishant Kathuria, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, um, about how we objectively assess uh, industrial symbiosis. And Nishant is asking if there is any type of measure in the literature that we could use to do precisely that. That is a very, very good question. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an issue that I didn't touch upon. Maybe I kind of alluded to it in my presentation that you, you might, if you go to Kalimbog, you might expect something very fancy, you know, and, 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 and you know, um, high level in, in every respect. And it's actually something much more humble and, and small and so, f and kind of almost like semi-professional in, in, in the way it's facilitated sometimes. There is this um, great recent paper by Chish here et al uh, on uh, barriers to the development of this, this circular economy, they strongly emphasize that, that is the interesting part of the paper, how developments in this area is, is often, the, the, according to their expert respondents, uh, they did a lot of interviews, often the barrier is cultural, as we just talked about the culture. It's about mindsets. It's not about the technology. The technology perhaps is there, but it's about mindsets a lot. But however, under technological barriers, they talk about the lack of proper data and documentations in KPIs. And actually, because it's a small thing, because it has worked the way it has, actually the numbers, the KPIs, the business case, the documentation for, for the benefits of, of the Kellenborg symbiosis are, I would say, distinctly weak. They have some numbers. I think they were produced by a guy, very cool guy, a young guy who did not have a, a PhD yet. So they are rough estimates. And the companies in the area has not, have not really invested in you know coming up with a more elaborate uh, you might say uh, more elaborate numbers and, and measures so i mean this is a huge you know, challenge here also when we talk about for instance uh, trust can be difficult to measure social capital can be difficult to measure and certainly the effects also of industrial symbiosis can be difficult to measure also if involved companies have can very much kind of a if you will narrow business mindset they just basically want to in most of the time optimize you know their business you need to invest you might say in in being able to 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 measure the kind of difference it makes and it's very difficult also i mean to 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 uh, or can be to come up with concrete measures measures of what would be the alternative greenhouse gas emissions or co2 emissions and so on and so forth they have a take on it they have a sense of it they have published some of it my general sense is it's relatively weak it's 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 it's, it's not and, and i guess the, one of the numbers they have in terms of of monetary benefits per year is something like a in the vicinity of 100 million danish kroner uh, like and it's, or 200 it's it's it seems like chump change so in terms of the 
objective measures here. There's so much work to be done in this field, and this goes for circular economy, life cycle assessments, and stuff like that overall. That I mean, so much work to be done. Indeed. Okay, we have a couple of interesting questions that relate your work to other literatures. Um, so I'll take I'll take one of them. Um, Teresa Hara is asking uh, a question about how you relate to another literature, which ties in with the question I had to how you relate to another literature. So let me lump them together. She points to a paper in the Journal of Operations Management by Ji Kao and Fabrice Lumino. I hope I pronounced this correctly. That paper looks at when contractual and relational governance complement and supplement each other. Um, and she's asking how that stuff might connect to what you're doing. I had a similar question about work by Chuck Sable, um, who's a sociologist now working in the law yeah. school, Columbia Law School. So Chuck um, talks about what he calls studied trust. So in situations where trust between organizations is important, um, you build it by making very small contractual relationships and leaving space for trust to form, which I think is the sort of thing that this survey paper talks about, and then slowly building it up. Um, has that sort of thing been studied in this context? I mean, Sable and his co-authors have looked at supply chains, for example, but I don't think they've looked at industrial symbiosis. Nope. Um, I would love, I mean, if Alan, if you can make sure that I get both references, I would be very grateful. I can do that. <laughs> like I said, I mean, I should not pretend to be an expert on relational contracting, for instance, as, as mentioned in the... Um, Adler framework, but I th think it could tie into the first one about contractual relational governance things. I think there's a potential there for saying when companies uh, under the cultural conditions that we've seen in Kalimbo engage into these contractual relations uh, with each other, there's something more at stake than just, you might say, the kind of spot contracting that is uh, assumed in economic theory. And again, you have people like, uh, what's he called, this, this Hoshias in, in this literature saying, this is just a normal case. There's nothing particular about it. It was never about sustainability. It was simply you know, a standard market uh, model. I don't think necessarily it was. I mean, you look closer, uh, we can get a, a, more, a keen sense of that. Um, but like I said, for instance, relational contracting, as far as I know, as far as my searching abilities has allowed me to see, has not been mentioned at all in this literature. So perhaps that's a potential answer. Can we come up with a better understanding so as not to, again, surrender to this kind of market fundamentalist view, you know, know that ultimately the market is, is superior uh, and, you know, all efforts to, to plan this is, 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 is failing and ultimately we should just leave things alone to develop of its, of its own. So uh, all types of literatures, and I'm sure there are quite a few, and I would love to have a look at these two, both Sable and the other one. I, I didn't quite get the author names, so if you could get them to me, Alan. Um, is, can, can certainly be, be relevant in understanding, I mean, what is happening in, in this, this contracting thing? Because this is, uh, again, it's all about understanding the, the uh, intricacies of how uh, these uh, different parties in, engage with each other. And a part of that is all about contract. There's a question here that is uh, quite different from Mark Elliott. Mark is asking, um, what what is out there about the effects of government incentives in investment decisions, irrespective of ethics or trust? How does uh, what type of role does does government play here? Um, I, I don't think I have a, an extremely concrete answer to that uh, because I simply my memory does not serve me that well. But mm -hmm. there are quite a few papers that focus on. I mean, for instance, I saw an overview of where um, the countries, um, the whole uh, literature on um, industrial symbiosis, what countries they cover. There's, for instance, a lot of stuff on the Chinese experience. That's that's the most prominent one. So there's a lot of literature on the different ways in which this has been translated into government programs and promoted and barriers and successes. I think uh, the, the clean cut business case, uh, that's a difficult one because the great successes are not that many. And I guess that's part of the, the critique of this. I mean, that there's been perhaps a lot of talk in industrial ecology circles about all that could be possible here and, and, and ideal notions. But in terms of delivering, in terms of creating the, the truly, you might say, eco-industrial park, uh, the one that lives up to all our dreams of what circular economy can be, uh, or 
and perhaps we just need to let go increasingly of the Kalm Borg as a template. But 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 uh, certainly, it's it's been extremely difficult to to come up with a recipe for making something similar to, to Kalm Borg happen. So I think it's it, rather than the, the clear cut business case for, for what can you get out of it, there's a, quite a lot of literature if you do the searches. That, that tap into, I mean, different governmental initiatives and also in a nuanced way talk about, I mean, how have they succeeded? How have they failed? I mean, it's just, like, there was a great paper on the Chinese experience. This has been part of Chinese law for, 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 for at least since 2006 or something like that. And a lot of these projects have failed simply because the capacity is not there and because a lot of it turns out to be voluntary and so on and so forth. So uh, a lot of uh, unfulfilled promise is certainly a, a large part of the, you know, the picture that you're seeing here because it's difficult because it's damn difficult and it's certainly not at all easy to to again look at Kalmbog and see a recipe and, and m making it happen and like I said one of the points made by Shertov and colleagues is that I mean, you shouldn't overestimate I mean a company's commitment to to sustainability agendas and so on and so forth uh, in, in the way that you understand this and whether we like that or not that certainly rhymes with a lot of experiences that I guess many of us have. Okay. Um, we're running a, we have a lot of questions here and we're running <laughs> on time. So um, we, we turn for at least one more. Um, Sabine Bauman is asking a question that um, I think is very interesting. Uh, and that's the, because the, the Danish experience um, in Kalenborg is relatively small in scale. Um, you, she wonders if you could think about this in terms of um, Eleanor Ostrom's work on governing the commons. Um, and if you could, I guess a supplementary question that I would have is, um, if that's the case, this presumably works only, you know, one way to design this might be to think about which industries you want to co-locate. So if you put enough of them there so that between them they would internalize everything, maybe that's enough. Then you can expect them to do an Eleanor Armstrong and govern the commons, commons for you. Is that fair or is it like dream? I, I, I should, should I, I can't say too much about uh, uh, her, her work. Um, uh, so I, I won't even pretend to be able to come up with something very qualified on that. Uh, but um, I think that the, the general point that can be made is, I mean, new industrial areas that are being planned. I mean, it's, it's obvious to, 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 to put this on the agenda. Um, and the question is then, do we only want to invite particularly sustainable companies? Um, do we want to keep certain things out? For instance, um, big butchery factories, for instance, you know, that they're, they're going to pose a huge problem. Is it about, for instance, inviting, you know, only the, 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 the good guys, the do-gooders to begin with? Or is it about something much more ambitious, uh, again, in terms of saying we can also have polluting companies here, but they, they need to be, uh, you know, collaborating with others? So I was thinking invite the polluters, but invite people who um, rely upon clean environment as well. Um, Absolutely. If you're a relatively but small group of people, you might expect them to negotiate in a sort of cosium to our way to... But I mean, the whole problem of the, of the trust issue and the ethical component and so on is, is involved here. And, and we know, I mean, uh, we shouldn't be, of course, idealistic about how decisions are made at the very highest level. For instance, there was an example in Kalenborg of a decision an exchange or a, a new exchange and a new stream that was being debated and they thought saw great potential. The decision, decision was kicked out to headquarters around Copenhagen and it died because locally they knew how to do this. If it got a little further away, now they couldn't really see any kind of a real value in it. So it is an ongoing challenge to make companies commit long-term to, to engagement with others. And, and we know that that is difficult uh, also because of the volatile environments that companies operate in and so on and so forth. So that is, that is certainly also an important part of this. I mean, what they're saying in Kalenborg is, the whole point is, this is, Kalenborg is only 100 kilometers away from Copenhagen, but in a small country like Denmark, that is a long, <laughs> actually quite a long mental distance, if you will. It's difficult to actually to attract and retain people there. And they're saying part of the reason why trust works is because that's kind of an a, a agreed assumption. We are here together. We're going to be together here for a long time. And therefore, we can commit to ourselves uh, more long term. Uh, whereas you might say, if you get closer to the, the big metropolis, I mean, it may, it may be a little more hustle and bustle and a little more short term. So there are all kinds of ways in, in which this plays into it. And the big challenge is, again, uh, also going back to the paper by Ram Shivad on, on, on individual companies' motivations, and I can certainly recommend that paper. 
where they, I, I think they start with the, the kind of more instrumental th thin trust, um, calculative trust, and, 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 and take it all the way to the, the more moral take, uh, what it takes to get companies to, to, to get there. Uh, but, but that's certainly yeah, a challenge in, in, in making companies commit with, with the uncertainties involved. And also the, the lack of, you might say, documentation with regard to ultimately the business case, both in environmental and profit terms. Okay, um, I'm afraid we're just about out of time. And that's a pretty good place to leave it. You've raised a lot of difficult and uh, challenging questions. And we've had some great questions. If you're one of the people whose questions we didn't get to, I'm very sorry. We, we did commit to, to finish on time and we're going to do so. Um, so I'm going to close by doing two things. First of all, let me advertise the next of these seminars, which will take place in two weeks. Um, Dorothy bauman Pulley is going to speak to us. Uh, giving a talk entitled Beyond COVID-19, The Case for Human Rights in Business. And um, let me, the final word is um, all of us saying thank you very much, Steen, for a really thank you. fascinating talk and for responding so well to such an extraordinarily eclectic collection of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you.